The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display their knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the last video, I tried to give you a glimpse into Paul's motivations, his calling, his longing, and his passion to tell the world about this amazing news. And that is really what his entire letter to the Romans is about. The gospel and what believing it practically means to a church divided into two very different groups of people. At a high level, Paul will try to explain in the first three chapters why we need this message. He'll explore the inescapable problem in each one of us, our sin. And then in the middle of chapter 3, at the lowest point, he'll suddenly introduce the very heart of the message, what Paul calls righteousness, God's righteousness. Until the very end of chapter 5, he'll describe what that righteousness means for us. From 6 through 8, he'll talk about the direct result of believing this message. And that's our freedom and the amazing new life and hope this freedom brings us. But right in the middle, in 7, he'll introduce us to God himself and how he's given us his spirit to lead us in this brand new life. Finally, from 9 through the rest of his letter, he'll walk through our responsibility to each other and to the world around us. And that's his letter. Our sin, his righteousness. Our freedom, his spirit. And finally, our responsibility. If you keep these words in mind as you read and look for them through your reading, you'll have clear waypoints to navigate your journey through his letter. And that, all that to give you an idea of where we are as we begin. In the past, God showed his wrath pretty clearly. In Genesis 6, we read, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become, that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. His heart, the heart of the one who made all things was filled with sadness and sorrow, deep disappointment and regret. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. And he did. We read of a global catastrophe, an apocalyptic disaster overwhelming the face of the earth. Other than Noah and his family, not a single human being survived the wrath of God. In the last book of the Bible, we read of the wrath of God unleashed on the future earth not with a flood, but with fire and earthquakes, with natural and with human catastrophes. So when Paul writes in Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men, I can't help but feel a little nervous. I remember running through the woods near our home when it began to rain heavily very heavily. Suddenly, 
flashes of lightning, roars of thunder, and then it began to pour. There's a rule that if you hear thunder within 30 seconds of seeing lightning, you should seek shelter for 30 minutes because it's within six miles of you. As I ran, the lightning and deafening thunder were simultaneous. There to my right, I understood very well why Martin Luther became a monk. It was terrifying. If this wasn't the wrath of God, what was? But as we will soon find out, the wrath Paul speaks of is very different. As we walk through this passage, we're going to finish this sentence. It begins with the word life. It's a summary of what Paul is about to tell us. So let's begin. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth, who cover it up, who hide it by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain or plainly visible to them, because God has made it plain to them. It's as if there are people who know clearly the truth about God, but don't want that truth to be known, to be revealed. Why? Why would anyone want to do that? That is Paul's very point. He's saying that by deliberately sabotaging, covering up, hiding, blurring their consciences of what the truth about God is and what it implies, they're setting themselves free to do whatever they want. It's as if their wickedness is not only the tool by which they suppress information about God, it's also why they do it. It's as if they are trying to find life apart from God. The truth about God will somehow interfere with a life they want to live and with things they want to do or gain, and so they cover it up. Well, what about God is so obvious that they're suppressing it? Paul goes on, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, and Paul gives us two of them, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Are these two things really that obvious? What is it that is seen that tells us about what is unseen? Like the wind, you cannot see it, but you know it's there because you feel something against your face. You see the grass and leaves moving, and you know that something is moving them. Though at a superficial glance, the universe around us seems random and chaotic, the more we learn and the more we discover about our universe, the very big things and the very small things, the more clearly we see an extraordinary order and rhythm. We see living, breathing machines of all shapes and sizes and patterns and colors engaging the world around them, processing energy at incredibly small scales to unimaginably large ones. Again and again, with literally everything we see around us, we see extraordinarily complex devices, engines, machines, working, running, executing incalculably complex tasks, moving, breathing. From quantum scales to galactic scales, we find complexity, movement, and order, not chaos and inertia and emptiness. Why? This is what Paul means when he speaks of God's eternal power. A few years ago, my son and I traveled to Iceland on a holiday. We rented a car and began circling the island heading east from Reykjavik in the southwest. It's an extraordinarily beautiful place filled with otherworldly landscapes. 
Several days into our trip, we were traveling up the east coast to get to the puffin capital of Borga Fjodor Estri on a long, beautiful road when we saw what looked like a tiny, bright green house, more like a shed on the left of the road, right next to a picnic table. There wasn't a person for many miles in any direction. And here, in the middle of literally nowhere, was this cute little shed. And inside the shed stood what looked like a vending machine. What would you think of me if I said, how extraordinary to see the power and force and blind luck of nature to carve such a beautiful shed and picnic table right here over millions of years. With no human being in sight, we were in awe over the beauty and convenience of such a thing built by the confluence of air and rain and fire that only time and chance had produced. Kudos, nature. You'd be right in calling me an idiot. Why? Because it was obviously built by human beings. It shows all the marks of it. Thought, design, intentionality, character, personality. Today we can see more clearly than at any other time in history how staggeringly complex our world and universe is. One single-celled bacteria found in a pond behind your home is unfathomably more complex than a little green shed I've shown you. And how much more complex are we by many orders of magnitude than a bacteria? And yet, it's easier to believe the shed was designed and the bacteria evolved over millions of years. Why? How do we know the difference between good and bad? How do we know that the violence and rape and murder and hatred and horrors on the grounds of Auschwitz in the 1940s was something we not only call bad and evil, but deep inside each of us, we know it? How do we know it? Where does such knowledge come from? Or that kindness and selflessness, honesty and generosity and love and peace is good. How do we know it? Where does it come from? Paul is saying that this specialized knowledge within each of us is direct evidence that not only is there an intelligent designer behind all things, but that he is good and not evil. Not even a mix of good and evil, but perfectly good. He loves goodness and hates evil. Recognizing the creativity and design of a work of art ought to point us to the artist. The woman with the parasol, the cradle, and the artist's garden all point us to the genius of an artist named Claude Monet. And we honor him as being one of the best, greatest artists our world has ever known. It would have been an unparalleled honor to have known him. Paul is saying precisely that about the one who made all things. In Psalm 139, I find great pleasure in, I'm amazed at you, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made because I've been made with extraordinary thought and care and precision. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. For although they knew God, they weren't ignorant of Him. They neither glorified Him, found pleasure and joy in Him as God, nor were they grateful to Him but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. All their thought and knowledge and understanding led simply to emptiness and a dead end and the lines between right and wrong slowly blurred. How? How were their hearts darkened? Paul goes on, 
Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God, the joy and pleasure and peace of knowing the one who made them, for images made to look like mortal man, like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. It's as if a boy, in anger at a rebuke from his dad, decides to exchange his father for a toy. This is better. This is a better father than mine. Or maybe it's a boy who decides to exchange his father for his inheritance. This is a better father than mine. At least this father gives me what I want. So what if it's just an idol? At least I'm happier. And suddenly Paul reveals the wrath of God. Listen carefully for three words Paul repeats over and over. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. He gives them what they want. He withdraws. He stands back. He stops speaking into their hearts. He stands away from the door. He lets them walk out of the house. And Paul breaks down. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts, and they cried, Freedom! Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. He doesn't tell us what the due penalty is, but at the very least, it is emptiness, utter pain, horror, fear, loneliness. Then begins the spiral of death. Furthermore, since they did not consider it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy murder, strife, deceit and lies, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil, and then right in the middle, they disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And now we can finish our sentence. Life apart from God leads only to death. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Jesus once told a story about a man who had two sons. The younger one said to him, Father, give me my share of the estate. So the father divided his property between them. He gave him what he wanted. Why? Why did the father give the son what he wanted? It seems insane to me. Why doesn't he rebuke him or just say no or, or explain how disgraceful he's acting? Why? Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, 
and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in real need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Why? Why did the father give him what he wanted? Maybe because that's the only possible way he'll realize how far he's always been from his father. Maybe it's the only way he can ever possibly know that apart from his father, nothing in all his empty dreams will ever bring him joy.